Hello, hello, and welcome to the Mindful Evolution Podcast. I'm Leah Drew, your host and mind body healing guide. This podcast is for the awareness seeker ready to go deeper, create change, and feel more empowered over their physical, mental, and emotional well being. My intention is to be a catalyst for you as we explore topics surrounding holistic health, mindset optimization, trauma healing, emotional intelligence, and much more. I'm so grateful to have you here and to support you as we evolve in mind, body, and spirit. Let's breathe in and out. Now, let's dive in. Hey friends, and welcome back to the Mindful Evolution podcast. Today, I am so very excited to have Barrett Perlman on the podcast. Barrett is a former professional wakeboarder turned psychedelic breakthrough coach. She's a fellow healing guide, and she's also the host of the Modern Hippie podcast. And honestly, Barrett's just overall an incredible woman who just happens to be one of my closest sisters and friends. Barrett is helping people intentionally use psilocybin to heal, move through transition, and discover more of who they truly are. Barrett, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so excited to have you. I'm so excited to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation. You're so welcome. It's an honor to have you here. And I know there's always an endless amount of things that you and I can talk about, especially uh, when it comes to psychedelics. Mm, Especially when it comes to psychedelics. (laughs) I love it because (laughs) you were one of the first people I ever met who used psychedelics in the same way I used psychedelics, which was for personal Mm. growth and for going into the healing and, and the trauma and going in there and renegotiating things within ourselves. It was powerful to get to know you. Yeah. And when we brought that together, we just ended up having these incredible psychedelic experiences just like intertwined. Mm. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. We create portals everywhere we go. <laughs> <laughs> we so do. <laughs> Other people, I hope, can get a little bit of that portal experience through our conversation today. Absolutely. <laughs> So, Barrett, you honestly are, hands down, one of the most devoted psychonauts that I know, that I have in my life, and it's been an honor witnessing you just dive deeper into that psychonaut journey and explore, just so fearlessly explore psychedelics in a way that helps you understand not only yourself, but the world around you in ways that's been beautiful to witness. And so I'm really curious what it means to you to be a psychonaut. Well, thank you for that. Um, It has been quite a journey. And to me, being a psychonaut means being an explorer of consciousness, truly showing up and having the courage to push past the fear and to go into the unknown and into the wild unknown, into the other dimensions, into... um, extraterrestrial civilizations into interdimensional travel, time porting, teleporting, into learning how to use your own energy to impact the world around you. Um, So yeah, being a psychonaut is diving deeply, going where few before have ever gone and almost essentially cataloging the wisdom that's received and bringing it back to share. And why does that feel so important to you to go deeper into those levels of consciousness and deeper into those understandings of all of these things underneath the surface? For me, there was a lot missing in my life before I did this. There was a lot of purpose missing. There was a lot of um, knowing that what I felt around me had more to it than what I could just visually see. Like when I was a kid, I used to stand on on tall objects like like walls and stuff and 
and feel the wind blow in my face. And I would always sort of be like, I know the wind has a message for me and I'm trying to figure out what it is. And it, it wasn't even until later that I got into um, exploring witchcraft and and honoring the seasons and the elements and those things that made sense to me. But as I ended a career as a professional wakeboarder, I was very much faced with the the reality that I may never find anything again to be as dedicated to in my life. There may be nothing that ever interests me as much. And this is the thing that I have found that interests me just as much, if not more, than doing flips and spins on a wakeboard every day. And so I just going in there and making new discoveries and then having them corroborated by other people, finding mentors who can help me go even deeper has just been life-changing. It has given me so much purpose um, because I seem to have a unique skill set of being incredibly resilient in this space. And I can face many, many an ego death and come out of it and be like, that was crazy. Cry and then laugh. <laughs> laugh that it was crazy. <laughs> oh, and you brought up this concept of like the ego death. And I'm curious how moving through so many of those ego deaths, because I have witnessed, I have listened, I have, I have just held you as you've moved through so many of these. And I'm curious for our listener, like, how has that supported your healing journey? The ego deaths seem confusing in the beginning because you really feel like you're going to die. Um, and in that space, there's a lot of fear that gets turned up. Like the dial on the fear gets turned way the fuck up because you're like, I don't want to die. You know, it's almost like don't ruin everyone's experience by dying. That would be a major buzzkill on the ceremony. But it's happening. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that feeling of if I become nothing, I am now gone. If I dissolve, I am no more. And what I've really discovered in those spaces is that they were negative frequencies, maybe not negative frequencies, they were lower frequencies of myself that shed off almost like a snake skin, right? How a, sh a snake is constantly evolving, getting rid of that outer layer that no longer serves it so the new fresh skin can, can rise up to the surface. And to me, that's what an ego death is. It is the shedding of that that layer that is most accessible, that doesn't serve you, that doesn't need to come with you into the next evolution of yourself. Yeah. So there's, there have been a lot of them for me in the last year, especially. And um, yeah, witnessing how they continue to come off. Like even when you think you've had enough, I've thought I've had enough, I'm good, I'm done. Um, even just yesterday during a bufo ceremony, I, I found myself in a deep dive vacuum space hole. And even that was kind of terrifying. That, it was scary enough to me that where I actually asked my facilitator for help. And I can't actually think I've I don't think I've ever actually asked a facilitator for help before. Um but it was beautiful because there was a part of me I was trying to access. There was a there were tears. We went into this second dose of Bufo with the intention that I had tears that needed to come out. I had tears that wanted to purge. It was right on the surface. And I identified that I was using laughter as a convenient alternative purge to not cry. And so I really wanted to go into the tears and the emotions and not take the cop out of laughing. And so I was kind of stuck in this vacuum and asked for help. And it was like, as soon as he moved closer, it gave me the safety and the permission to unlock that. And so I think oftentimes ego deaths as well are when we find ourselves in that scary place. And the more that we can turn down the dial on the fear, turn up the volume on the surrender and explore that with a sense of curiosity, the more we get the medicine. Mm -hmm. I love that explanation of the ego death because it, it's so true, like especially bringing it back to to the snake, right? The metaphor of the snake, like as the snake sheds its skin, you get to see what's underneath. And I love how you relate the ego death to that because it's so true. Like as you release this 
this ego, this belief of who you think you are and this idea and understanding of like who you think you are and what is around you and what is your world within you, you get to see what's underneath that. You get to experience this this new skin, this new understanding of yourself and and the world around you. And I, I, I've witnessed you be able to shift significantly over the, how, the last couple of years of knowing each other and just watch you go through one ego death and take a look in the mirror and be like, oh, hi, right? Like this, <laughs> like this new version of yourself. And that's why, why I love you so much because you're constantly evolving and you're constantly looking at these new angles of yourself and integrating these new parts of you. And I think that's such an important part of healing and growth and transformation is being able to surrender and being able to release these parts that you might be holding on to for the sake of safety, right? Mm. To keep you safe, to keep you in that, like that place of knowing, right? The, but the place of knowing I'm referring to as like the familiar, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. yeah. allowing yourself to hold on to that ego to stay in that familiar territory, which is really not where you experience the exponential growth. Totally. And you recently had uh, an ayahuasca ceremony that I was did. transformative. Did you get some ego death mm. in that one? Mm. You know, in the past, in some of my ayahuasca ceremonies, I have experienced the the ego death like significantly. It's been very prevalent. Has been very prevalent in this particular journey that I I sat with recently. I didn't so much experience the ego death as I did witnessing myself in the transformation that I was moving through. If that makes sense, mm. and. In the most recent journey for me, it was really seeing where I was at in my world with the medicine, feeling like everything was burning down and everything was crumbling so that a new could, a newness and a new experience could be created. And those were really the the themes of the two nights that I was out was the first night it was just crumbling and burning and, and smoke and just the demolition of of what was creation in in transitioning to the second night was the creation of like what is meant to be and connecting with my inner knowledge and really connecting with what am I here for? What is being birthed within me? And so in some ways, I guess you could say there was some like ego death and rebirth, but it didn't feel like the ego. It felt like it was this Kind of like you were talking about earlier with standing on the wall and as, as, a, as a kid and just having the wind like blow through you. There's almost this ability to just completely remove myself from the experience to be the observer from so far away with the medicine and just allow myself to move through that transition rather than putting the brakes on or having all the fear come up or like trying to hold myself back from it. Because it was such a big transition for me. And that's one of the things that I love about psychedelics personally is the ability to be the observer and to just witness what it is that I'm moving through and what it is that is transitioning and transforming so that you can see that new skin that you're stepping into. So that for me was was my experience, but I definitely have had the the challenging ego deaths in in some of my journeys for sure. Yeah. Man, they they can be very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> They're so needed though. And if you try to avoid them and resist mm-hmm. them, you just it it just gets stronger. Mm-hmm. And what I love too is that I've noticed within myself, the more of them I've had, the more I quickly transform. And I think different people have different bandwidths for their ability to integrate something like that, for them to feel complete in the newness of who they are and to really take the the new frequencies and the new mindsets and to adopt them. Um, And I, 
feel like there's something about my process that really is just sponge-like and keeps those things in. And as I continue to explore, they just, they've started compounding exponentially. Mm. Yeah. I know that you've had so many experiences in different ways or different medicines. And uh, it sounds like through all of them, you've been able to take away different parts and be with different types of ego death. Mm. Yeah. Different types of ego <laughs> deaths. <laughs> I had this one in Peru in July. Um, I was on an eight, eight ceremony ayahuasca retreat. And it was the third night, I think, that I had this massive ego death where I was just like laying on my back, looking up, and my higher self was like uh, in the clouds above me, just looking down at me, eyes locked, sending some sort of message. And I felt like every single orifice I had needed to have something escape from it all at the same time. Like I needed to cry. I needed to burp. I needed to pee. I needed to poop. I needed to vomit. I needed to have gas escape parts of me. I didn't think I was capable of having gas escape. And I thought if it all happened at once, I was just going to be like a bomb and like just dissolve into nothingness. And, um, you know, later sort of realized these, the ways in which they were pointing to coming out of my body were very Merkaba shaped inside of me. And as I lay there, I it was very uncomfortable. And I was sort of screaming in my head at my shaman for help. And he reminded me that you're you, you've got this. I've got you from here and everything's okay. And then that was the point where I was like, okay, he's right. The fear is irrational. I am not going to die. And so if I know I'm not going to die, what will I do differently? And instead, I got to relax and to dissolve and to feel that that point as we dance between being who we are, who we think we are, and then being everything, who we think we are and everything. And that was a very powerful lesson as the parts of me that then also shed off that I didn't get to come with me to the next evolution of myself. And it became a lot more fun to explore it with curiosity. <laughs> I think you bring up a really unique point here and around working through this ego death and accepting this ego death with also releasing things from your body, like within your body, right? You're talking about the gas, the burping, the peeing, the pooping, the vomiting. And for those of you that are listening, that that aren't familiar with this, the body holds on to everything. Body keeps the score. It holds on to trauma. It holds on to experiences and it holds on to all of it in the form of energy. And one of the most powerful things, in my opinion, about psychedelics is that through the psychedelic, you get to release that energy. You get to release those things that your body has held on to that's trapped, that's protecting you or keeping you safe, like we were talking about earlier. But through releasing that, you actually get to come into this new version of yourself because that energy is releasing and your energy is then recalibrating, finding a new equilibrium and a new balance. And through that, we're talking here about experiencing this ego death. And I think it's really interesting just like listening to you explain all that and hearing like the release of trauma, the release of energy, the release of like what's in the body with, oh, on the other side of that, you have this you move through this crazy ego death. And on the other side of that, you're just this, wow, like you're just everything. Mm, yeah. I, I love that description of it. And it, it sort of correlates to how you approach the experience. If you get in that space and you allow the fear to overcome you and you start to resist and you start to try to hang on to life as you know it, it becomes harder. It becomes darker. It becomes all the things that you don't want it to be. <laughs> and when you let go and you surrender and you trust that you're being held, then it becomes all of the important lessons that you're meant to download. Having this conversation right now is bringing me back to ceremonies that you and I have sat in together in the room that you're sitting in right now. <laughs> and <laughs> those of, that, of you that have sat with me in a ceremony, um, particularly in Barrett's home, probably know that I'm a throat clearer. I huck loogies. 
what what when I take mushrooms and it's like it's totally my way of like of clearing my body like some people are burpers and some people are like you know like release these big breaths some people shake and I don't know what it is for me and actually if I if I think about it I, I do know what it is in, in my opinion um there's been a big process for me of learning to find my voice through song mm. through tone through speaking and I think back to all the ceremonies that you and I have sat in together and me just like like aggressively just hawking stuff out of my throat <laughs> and you and Val be sitting there and be, be like Leah let's calm down over there it's quite a process um, <laughs> quite a process but like clearing that space for things to to come through and I I just I love that concept with with psychedelics in general it's just they're there to support you in clearing the space so that new things can come through for you yes I I had a client the other day who came to me specifically because she wanted to reclaim her voice her authenticity, her confidence. And she had many experiences where when she spoke her truth, like at work, for instance, she was reprimanded for speaking up and pointing something out that was happening that shouldn't be happening. She was reprimanded. Or as a child, she was reprimanded. Um, and so as we began to work, work this out through her, it started as like gut-wrenching sounds, like uh, uh, that would come out of her and it eventually led to convulsing and shaking um, to the point where I had to stop and, and sort of re-regulate her nervous system to kind of get it to die down. But then she had these just like shockwave convulsions of this, this, the body releasing all of the years of trauma in not just her, but in her lineage. And as her lineage dated back through her Korean heritage of women being silenced and then it expanded mm -hmm. out yeah. to slavery and all of the people who lost their lives to speak their truths. And all of this was moving through her. This, this was so much bigger than just her in this lifetime as we moved it through. And um, then there was finally a moment where she just broke sobbing and sobbing. And um, we were playing singing bowls right before that point. And it started to to move it out of her body again. And she had been primarily not able to communicate with me most of the ceremony. Like she could kind of nod and say, mm -hmm, but she couldn't hold a conversation. Um, and at that point she finally said like, I have this thing and I want to get it out. And I was like, okay, now that we've communicated, let's get it. And then this message moved through her like a freight train. And it was so powerful to witness that it was just sitting in like the fourth dimension behind her, this powerful message of my truth deserves to be heard because it is spoken with love and just how to set everyone free with love and what we're here to do, what she's here to do. And it just mm, moved through her in the most incredible mm. ways. So it's really powerful to witness how the psilocybin and myself facilitating were able to open those doors for that the healing within that sounds incredibly powerful and you know the ability especially with mushrooms in my opinion with with psilocybin the ability to witness yourself and notice what it is that your challenges are that's blocking you and then to be able to see where they are connected and to see the domino effect of how it got to you right mm -hmm. to see the bigger picture like the, the pattern doesn't start with you. It didn't, usually doesn't start with you. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that something started with you. It's usually looking at the societal conditioning, looking at what happened to your parents, to your generations, to generations past, right? And for this woman, that you're, this client that you're talking about, like coming all, going all the way back to slavery and back to her voice being muted, it, that's such a powerful, I'm sure for her, it sounds like it was a very powerful like connection to make of understanding where that that came from that conditioning came from absolutely and it was hooked in her around her neck it was like being released from her collarbone and her neck and it was coming out mm -hmm. in just 
thousands of years of trauma and repression. Mm. Oh, go her. Yeah. It was, I'm very proud of her. She took a five grams as well. And so she was, uh, she's very not sensitive to the medicine. So she says, but I felt like she was plenty sensitive <laughs> and leave it to a good heroic dose to, uh, to shake the things out quite literally. Mm -hmm. I think that brings That's up another thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. The important point of, um, taking the dose that you're ready for, that you've built up to that you're capable of taking and working with someone to help you figure out what that dose is. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. You know, and especially if you're like new to the medicine of, of any form, you know, like maybe not necessarily like starting with a heroic dose that, that might not be what you need. It's probably not that, what you need. That also might be. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. Probably don't start heroic. Pro, pro tip from Barrett Perlman. <laughs> Probably not what you need. Yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly I, I, I think what people often need is a, is a strong experience, which is more around like three grams, which is not classified as a heroic dose. But it certainly work and, and dance that with everyone. And how comfortable are you being, quote unquote, out of control? How comfortable are you with seeing visualizations? Do you have any past experiences with being drunk or high? How did that go? To sort of gauge what I think they'll be able to handle in terms of dosing. Yeah. That sounds like a great way to, to gain some insight as to what someone actually needs versus what they think they need. Yeah. And I do. I have a lot of clients who are like, they're like, I don't know. I trust you. And I ask the questions and it's like, ooh, maybe we should go a little lower. And then they're like, well, but I do really want to surrender. And so then it's like dancing this line of mm -hmm. how much do we push you and how much, you know, it's getting to know someone as well. Like when you say you want to be held in the safe environment, you want to get out of your comfort zone. And that involves letting go of control and you like holding on to control. How much do I trust mm -hmm. you? And that's a good point. Absolutely. The other thing you brought up too is the convulsing. And mm. for anyone listening, that's not something to be afraid of. Shaking, convulsing is something that's very natural. And in my opinion, a very important part of being with any type of psychedelic is allowing yourself to move through that. And you think about animals and you think about how animals shake just so just they just do it naturally. Right. Mm -hmm. How often does a dog shake? Like like multiple times a day. Apollo's like, right behind me, you know, does it all the time. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's something that we don't do as humans. We don't we aren't dancing in on a daily basis in tribes and communities like we used to, you know, centuries ago. Mm. And that movement is a huge part of releasing energy that's trapped in your body. It's a big reason why for anybody that knows me and follows me on social media, I'm always dancing. I love to dance because it's a way to move things through the body. And when you're not with sitting with the medicine, it's a way to shake it out. Mm. A way to just like take it off and release it and let it go. Um, so I love that you brought up that the part of her experience was through convulsing and shaking. And that's such an important part of like allowing yourself, your body to just like do what it needs to do. Mm, absolutely. And there's so much that can come out, you know, and also identifying too when it's out of control versus something that's, that's helpful yes. for the body. So. Mm -hmm. And like you said, too, like sometimes it's important to ask for help, you know. And that's why I think it's so important to always, most of the time. To, to be with someone else when you're sitting in a journey, even if you're doing, going on a journey by yourself, like letting someone know that, hey, I'm, I'm about to step into a journey. Just want, want someone to have an idea that this is happening in my household right now. Yeah. Keep it safe. Let someone know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about different forms of psychedelics. Is there any particular psychedelic that you have found the most benefit in personally and why? For me, I love psilocybin mushrooms. 
They are the medicine I started with. They are the medicine I was called to work with. They are the me- it is the medicine I use most regularly. Well, right now I'm dabbling in a lot of ketamine. I'm doing a lot of ketamine research. But psilocybin is powerful. She's gentle. She's very intelligent. She's often not too much uh, compared to ayahuasca, compared to bufo, compared to other medicines. Um, I think people can find her to be too much when they resist what comes up and an experience becomes challenging. But at any with any medicine, if you resist what comes up, the experience is going to become challenging. So for me, I, I love the duration period. It seems just about right. You know, it's about four hours long and it gives you a chance to really sit in it, get lost in it, and then still come out and have it not have to be this like massive experience like San Pedro, for instance, which is like eight to 12 hours um, along with acid is like eight to 12 hours. Those are very big the commitment, <laughs> big time commitments, uh, yes. to being in the medicine for that space of time. So yeah, mushrooms. I, for me also, I, I grew up with an obsession for mushrooms, like not even the, the magical kind, but just the edible kind. Um, you can, I can never put too many mushrooms in my food. I've always just been like, how many mushrooms can you possibly fit in this dish? And then double that. And that's maybe we're good now. So it just has been a thing for me my whole life. And as I've learned even more about mushrooms, I see their lineage in having always been a healer. And yeah, that really resonates with me. Hmm. Yeah, you've definitely always in my book been the mushroom girl from day one that, that I've known you. <laughs> Thank you. When- <laughs> I get to drink out of my mushroom mug every day and think about mm. my mushroom girl girl that's just the greatest friend I have. Aww, thank you. I sip out of mine and think about you too. I got this yes. mushroom mug for Leah for her birthday. I think it was I think it was your birthday or Christmas one year and it was my birthday. And it's this great mug and it's got a mushroom for a handle and I just I loved it mm. so much I had to get a matching one. Oh, it's it's so fantastic. If you guys follow us on social media, you'll probably see our mushroom mugs in our stories at some point in time. Mm-hmm. Solid. <laughs> so speaking of mushrooms uh, and psilocybin particularly, what do signs tell us about psilocybin as a healing modality? Mm. Psilocybin does some really wonderful things to the body. It helps the neural pathways in your brain actually regrow and regrow 10% stronger. So there's a lot of work going around about the you know the, neur- um, the neurons that fire together wire together in your brain, but when you're on psilocybin, it actually wires them together stronger. And so, what those implications are is that when you l- learn something, you actually will remember it better. And because we're in that state, our brains are neuroplastic, which means they're much more flexible and malleable. They're more open to receiving new information. And so you can do great things like um, mental reprogramming, mindset mapping, um, affirmations. The ideas that you go over in that medicine space will rewire stronger into your brain. So that's pretty fucking cool. Mm -hmm. And then it also has wonderful health benefits. Um, We're seeing – I have a friend whose um, son had seizures and after a year of using microdosing, no longer, uh, it it was a year of microdosing that he didn't have any seizures. And before that he was having at least like one a month, like a grand mal seizure one a month. Um, So that was fantastic. It's also helping a lot with people who have traumatic brain injuries. And because it reconnects those neural pathways and allows them to wire back together stronger, people who have a lot of brain fog and discombobulation from that, that head impact are actually feeling themselves return to the state they remember before their head injury. And that is incredibly powerful. Um, I've helped several athletes get on a microdosing protocol who has completely changed and revolutionized their life. Like they thought all was lost. They thought this would have to be how they would be forever. And along with traumatic brain injuries, they're, they're happy there usually comes a bit of depression 
and it's chemical at that point. And so mushrooms can also help people in that situation reconnect with that ever expansive love of source and themselves. And as the brain comes back together and starts to function again normally, they begin to have normal, quote unquote, normal interactions again with the world around them. But it's not always instant either. Um, there's a veteran I worked with and synchronistically, um, it was just over a year ago, we did his ceremony and it was life-changing. And he continued to take mushrooms after that because he said, I want to tap more into that space. Um, and he still struggled with depression. He still had his ups and his downs, but um, was nowhere near the place that he had been a month before our ceremony where he drove out to the desert with a shotgun and was ready to kill himself. He came to pick up some microdose pills for me, uh, what turned out to be literally a year from the day of his very first mushroom ceremony. And he said, you know, in the last week, something has flipped. A switch has completely flipped. And I feel good most days. He's like, I don't know that I can ever remember having ever felt good most days. And he's like, it's, and it's the only thing he did differently in his life really was start taking mushrooms, turn off the drinking, start taking mushrooms. Mm. And he, and that is now his consistent baseline is like fine True. to good. And that was someone who used to be bad to maybe okay. That, that mm. transformation is what it is. I mean, I hate to say what it's all about, but it's um, certainly incredibly powerful and makes me incredibly grateful for the medicine and sharing that because we don't have to be stuck with the head trauma. We don't have to be stuck with the brain fog. We don't have to be the result of our accident. We can move through the concussions and the trauma and whether it's physical or mental or emotional there is hope when you implement a tool alongside doing the work. I love hearing hearing that those results and they're results that I hear very often from people that have are struggled with depression that are often related to to head trauma. And you know, when you look at a more like chemical level of the body, depression usually is we're looking at a lack a reduction in serotonin, a reduction in dopamine, a reduction of your quote unquote happy hormone. Mm. And thank you. And um, with that, what the psilocybin does is that it supports with naturally starting to increase your body's ability to produce those and to normalize those levels. And it plays an effect not just on the brain, but on the gut as well, because that brain and the gut are so interrelated. Mm. And so it's so common that I hear people come to me, and this is an experience of myself as well, has been being able to move through a lot of really dark, depressed times in my life with the support of microdosing. Mm. And, you know, there's benefits to macrodosing just as much as there are benefits to microdosing. They both have such beautiful results that they yield and support that they yield. So I love hearing that your clients been able to see and feel some massive differences in his physical and mental and emotional body in the last year through both macro and micro dosing. Absolutely. And it doesn't always take a year either. Um, I had another client and she she was, um, she's a volleyball coach and she was starting her own coaching program. And one of the things she was showing up saying was, I don't know how I'm supposed to coach others when I can't even do my own dishes. I'm too tired to do my own dishes. And she had been in a traumatic car accident about a year prior that left her in a coma in the hospital for a little bit. And as she came out, she identified she's never been the same. And you know, she looked around. She's like, I am a slob. How am I supposed to teach other people to be better? And I said to her, you know, have you tried microdosing? And she said, I'm open to anything. I don't know about it. Tell me about it. So I explained it to her and she said, 
sure, I'll try it. And within two days, she was calling me crying because she had forgotten what it felt like to have energy. She had not only cleaned all of her dishes, she had vacuumed, she had waxed the floors, she had put everything away, and she had mapped out all of the the content for her upcoming program. And it was absolutely life-changing for her to begin to get those neural pathways firing again, to get the brain fog to go away, essentially, and to have her brain return to what she remembered her brain felt like before the accident. Mm. I love that. Yeah, me too. (laughs) So, like, you're so passionate about psychedelics. You're particularly very passionate about psilocybin. What is it that led you to discover the healing powers of psilocybin specifically? My own journey. Um, I was very depressed for most of my life. And in hindsight, had a lot of brain fog going on, partially from head hits, wakeboarding, but also from diet um, in, in retrospect, truly. And there was a day I was, there were many times that I was suicidal. And on this one particular day back in, I think, 2016, I was ready to take my life. And I also happen to have like an eighth of mushrooms laying around. And I I was going through a breakup and in that breakup had really been led to believe a lot of things about myself that may have felt true for him in the moment and may have been how I acted, but certainly weren't going to be my long-term truth. Things like um, that I was abusive, that I was incapable of being in a relationship that I was selfish, that I was violent, that I was mean, Um, all words that I didn't associate with and all words that certainly don't describe me now, but that were behaviors that were coming out of me at that time in my relationship. And when he broke up with me, I just didn't want to, didn't want to be that person. And I didn't know what to do about it. So I um, had, you know, sort of figured out a way that I would take my life and texted my best friend, all my my mom's information and all my passwords so she would be able to let people know and said, you know, but I've got these mushrooms and I think I'm going to take them and I'm going to see if anything changes. And who knows, maybe you all have some, something will happen that will make me not want to end my life. And it was my first spiritual awakening happened during that mushroom journey. I had been told to look myself in the mirror on mushrooms. And it's a very controversial topic. Many people will say, don't look yourself in the mirror. And I say, absolutely look yourself in the mirror. But also, you know, know what you're doing when you're looking yourself in the mirror. Know what you're looking for. I had no idea what I was looking for. And I got really fucking lucky that my guides came and took my consciousness by the hand and started yanking me around and showing me things because I was sort of relaxing my eyes in the mirror and my two eyes became one in the middle of my forehead and I'm just relaxing and looking into that one eye and all of this information started coming to me. All of these, um, downloads. I was seeing images through the sides like I was in a a tunnel all of a sudden. And if I stopped looking at the eye and tried to look at the images, they would go away. And so as I'm looking in this eye, something starts communicating with me, like almost like there's a voice in my head that starts talking to me. And it was like, you need to love yourself. And I was like, that's a big fucking statement compared to where I am right now. Um, I may not know what that looks like. I may actually have no idea how to love myself. And this consciousness said, okay, then let's sit on the floor. And Apollo was right there with me, my dog, and said, look at Apollo. Look at how much you love Apollo. Fill with the love you feel for Apollo. Fill with it. Fill with it. Fill with it until you're bursting and I'm filling with it. I'm like in tears. I love him so much. 
And then this consciousness drops a mirror between what I'm expressing out towards my dog. And this mirror magically bounces all of that back on myself. And my body filled with this overwhelming sense of unconditional love for me. And I had never felt that a single day in my life before. And it changed all of my cells in an instant. Um, so I, and then I'm just sobbing. I'm sobbing on the ground, sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. And honestly, that that session, you could not take that high from me for two months. Two months. I was so in love with life. I was so in love with myself. Um, and and figure, and that was the journey that made me go, holy shit, what's going on with these mushrooms? I had no idea that there were plant medicines at the time. I had no idea that there were psychedelic therapies. I had no idea. In fact, everyone I told that I, I took mushrooms to was like, oh my God, you could have killed yourself. Yeah. Oh my God, how could you take them by yourself? Oh, you did what? You took them by yourself alone? How so reckless? Don't do that. You could have a bad trip. And I'm like, no, it was the most incredible experience in my entire life. And so from that moment, I decided that there was something to these mushrooms and I wanted more of it. And I started taking them pretty much monthly. Like once a month, I would have what I called my mushroom journeys and I would turn off all the lights in my apartment. I would light a bunch of candles. I would take the mushrooms and I would go lay in my bed and just wait for information to come. And you know, we can tend to make the silly mistake at the beginning that we can never recreate a journey twice. You can never create a journey twice. <laughs> and so I was very disappointed the second time I took them because I did not fill with the unconditional love for self that I had been gifted the first time. In fact, I think the second time was really challenging and a lot of past relationships were brought up and a lot of tears were cried and I came out of it feeling worse than when I had gone into it. But what that had really done in hindsight was illuminate the things that were causing me so much pain, which was predominantly mm -hmm. relationships. And not even, you know, now, now in hindsight, relationship to self, relationship to my pain that got brought into those relationships and the way that I showed up or the way that they showed up. And as I continued to sit with the medicine, it continued to illuminate particularly relationships and it began to frame things in new ways and it began to show me the lessons I was being taught instead of having constantly felt like a victim of these relationships. Like why? Why did they have to hurt me so badly? Why? Why couldn't they just make me feel safe and secure? Why? Why this? Why that? Their fault, not mine. And instead I got to learn some really beautiful lessons that gave me appreciation for my past instead of a pain that controlled me and a power that it had over me. And I spent mm. from that point onwards, just time sitting with them by myself. I was like, you know what? Nobody else understands. Fine. I am having the most incredible experiences and I am becoming a better person for it. And, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm someone who has three DUIs and I have had a love for drinking. And I had a love for getting out of control with my drinking because I would drink and I would realize all the parts of me that I didn't feel comfortable with and I would just want to numb them away. And the mm -hmm. mushrooms gave me were, – were able to be utilized as that tool that helped me see that I could actually love those parts of me, that I could forgive the things that I did, that I could forgive myself, that I could forgive others and to grow and blossom from that and be able to own my story and own my past and own it for all the lessons that it shares and carries and gets disseminated around me now because of the fucking bullshit. <laughs> mm -hmm. So for that reason, I am incredibly passionate about mushrooms. It, it eventually came to me when I started sharing with people how I was doing mushrooms, that I was doing them in a very unique and a very special way. And then around, I want to say 2019, 2020, I started seeing the research coming out about psychedelics. I started hearing about it and hearing how 
other people had gone deeply and they were experiencing aliens and other dimensions or other people were or that they'd been using this actually in therapeutic settings and clinical settings for what since the 60s the 50s uh, at least the 60s and um mm. i was like shit i was onto something this whole time and i fumbled around and discovered it myself and i think that that kind of makes my journey really unique um there's a lot that you learn when you have no other foundation for what it's supposed to look like. And then with that as a foundation to actually seek out teachers and more information and courses and study and, and grow to develop my own capacity to now help others walk that journey. Thank you for sharing your, your journey into the medicine. I'm really glad that you're still here with us and I'm really glad that you've been able to learn so much through the medicine about yourself and about what is available to you when you allow yourself to experience that. Thank right? you. And you know, one of the things that I always remind anyone that comes into my world is that, you know, it, it's always your choice. It's it's always your choice. And that can be so hard to, and I think, to recognize sometimes when you're so deep in it and everything just feels like shit and the world just feels so dark and it's like, well, like, I don't want this. But in order to not have that, it's, it's a matter of choosing something different, you know, and you chose to sit with the mushrooms. You chose to look at yourself in the mirror. You chose to feel this love that you were being guided to feel and feel that reflected back within yourself. And you then chose to keep going back and to keep going in and to keep looking deeper. And, you know, one of the questions I have for you, given some of what you just shared around some of the, the challenge, more challenging experiences, there's a lot of people when the topic of mushrooms or psychedelics come up that are like, I'm not ever going to touch those because either A, I'm afraid of having a bad trip or B, I had a bad trip and I don't ever want to experience that again. My question to you is, do you see there being any relationship between having a quote unquote bad trip and resistance to looking at the thing, resistance to accepting and looking deeper at what's being shown? Yes, I do see a correlation between the two. And I think some people also have some dark shit. And I mm -hmm. think that you can also relate it to their relationship to looking within. If they are not a self-reflective person, when those dark self-reflective self things come up, it is going to feel much more challenging than if someone like you or I look at it, right? We can almost mm -hmm. see the fun in playing with our dragons. I mean, I love dragons in general. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do know some very spiritually adept people who go into the medicine or are confronted with darkness. And I think that there is a path for everyone to walk with the medicine and that those journeys are so incredibly important. They are perhaps more important than the ones that are full of love and full of light. Those are the journeys where you get to illuminate the shadows and you get to turn them into light. If you're just looking at the light, it's already lit. And you want to take those shadows and just turn on the lights. And so... Perhaps that means being in a guided setting, right? Being with someone that you trust to, to got you. Um, yeah, I, I didn't have anyone around for mine when they were challenging. You know, I, I had myself, I fell apart myself. And I love now that even as I continue to do my own work, that I have guides that I turn to, to hold me when I go to the deepest and, but yes, I do also think that much of that for most people can be circumnavigated by embracing 
what comes up and exploring it with a sense of curiosity and play and acknowledging that just because you're going into the darkness, it doesn't have to be evil. It can be play. It can be, what is that shadow? I don't know. Why don't you tell me a little more about you, shadow? Tell me a little more playfully. You can actually request things of what's being shown to you. You can request oftentimes that the medicine be a little more gentle, that the medicine be a little more direct, that the information come at you in a way in which you're capable of receiving it. And oftentimes people aren't equipped with those kinds of tools when they sit with the medicine to know, to ask, especially something like ayahuasca. She's a giver. Mm. She is a Mm. giver. (laughs) And you can poke and prod and ask questions, and she's got answers for days. Yeah, I love how you said it's oftentimes those more challenging journeys that are the most potent and impactful ones. And I've had my own experience with that, um, particularly with ayahuasca, my my second journey, um, my third and fourth time sitting, my second weekend. I will never forget it was the darkest, scariest experience that I had ever had with psychedelics in my life. And it was like all of the dark entities in the room just all attacked me all at the same time. And I I couldn't get it to stop. And at that point, I was still learning a lot about my own personal gifts, my intuition, my my own relationship with the word mediumship and what was happening within me and as scary as that experience was it taught me so goddamn much about being my own protector and how to create those boundaries and how to create safety within and around myself regardless of what's happening around you and just like you're saying a lot of people don't have those tools going into being with psychedelics and they're not taught how to create protective barriers around them they're not taught how to shoo off negative energies how to prevent them from coming in and attaching to to themselves and that led me to gaining so much power over my energy over my ability to like stand so strong Mm. and be the observer and that's actually that's where my my drag and I came from was my my second sit with Alaska where I learned all of that. And I learned what happens when you step into a space and you do not energy energetically protect yourself. Mm. And I think that it's important to do that regardless of where you go. That's my own personal opinion. Um, but especially when you're working with the medicine, like being mindful of what energy you're carrying, how you're protecting yourself, what tools you have in your toolbox to pull on if you need them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll never forget the experience you told me when you battled a demon in your living room. Like, like these things happen. Yeah. These things, you know, and, and it's hard to comprehend. I think it can be hard to comprehend for someone that's never sat deeply with the medicine. Um, but yeah, I I personally, you know, firsthand have that experience of of recognizing how life changing and transformational a dark and challenging journey with psychedelics can be. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's honorable for people to seek knowledge to grow their toolkit. You know, if, especially if you intend to sit with the medicine alone, really know what you're what you're getting into how to create a safe space Mm -hmm. how to navigate how to steer how to maybe even move energy through you tools that are available like dance is a powerful tool to shift the entire ceremony um so is vocalizations so is burping coughing purging in all of its forms Mm -hmm. And beginning to learn those those sorts of things or seeking out a guide who can help you move through that space, who can help you 
channel the journey that you want to go on, who can bring those messages to the forefront as you need them. Like you. Like me. <laughs> that that brings me into, um, I think that's a great leeway into my next question that I have for you is, what is the difference between using psilocybin recreationally versus using it in a, a particularly intentional healing container? Mm. I I honor that people use the medicine recreationally. I know I certainly have and do sometimes. Um, my perspective on that is at least they're putting the medicine in and they're reaping some benefits that they may not even be aware of. I think recreationally, if they're taking it in community settings, there's something very powerfully healing about community. And often in community, we're celebrating, we're dancing, we're moving, we're enjoying each other's company. So I think that can be very beautiful. Taking the medicine intentionally in ceremony is very differently focused. I think taking it recreationally, everyone wants to take it and have a good time. And that's cool. You can't always count on that. And Taking the medicine intentionally is embracing that what you are consuming is an intelligent medicine, especially fungi, especially mushrooms. I mean, the, the mycelial kingdom that runs beneath our feet everywhere we walk on this earth is mind-blowing. And the communication that it sends between all of the plants, the animals, between us humans, and once you take more of that fungal medicine – the more that you get tied into that mycelial network. And so I love sitting with the medicine intentionally. For me, that's where the beauty is. That's where the magic is. That's where the transformation is because it, it forces us to sit down and to look at ourselves. And especially if you're doing a, like a solo journey or you're doing guided one-on-one, -on -one, even in a group setting, they're often very meditative and self-reflective. And so looking at ourselves is just powerful. I mean, you can't change what you can't eliminate. And so mm. in order to begin to look at those shadows, we have to spot them first. And we have to have someone else, even if it's the medicine, show us where we can improve, what we can let go of, where we can heal, where we can send more love. And being in that medicine space and really looking at it allows for the phoenix to emerge, for the phoenix to light itself on fire and transform into the next version of itself. I love what you said. You can't change what you can't, or you can't change what you don't illuminate. You can't change what you can't illuminate. Mm -hmm. That illumination is like so important. Yeah. And I, I think that that's part of what makes a healing container so powerful with psychedelics is the intention is to really illuminate these components and these parts in comparison to recreational use where you're just like going and having a fun time with your friends at the beach or something, you know, which is like cool. And um, disclaimer as well, because mushrooms do have the intelligence of their own all psychedelics do so if you are taking something recreationally there is always a chance that something's going to come up for you mm -hmm. and you may not be in a space where you're actually prepared to handle that you know I'll, I'll never forget the night that we celebrated Valerie's birthday at the beach mm, and yes. we were sitting by the fire and you and I had taken a small amount of mushrooms that night Mine wasn't. Small. We were just like hanging out. Yours <laughs> is not usually small, Barrett. <laughs> and I, I don't. I think we. I think I maybe took around a gram that night. It, it was a smaller dose. Hmm. Um, and I, I remember like that. Maybe sure? I don't. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But I'll never forget, like, that was the night that you and I were just, like, you know, more recreationally using mushrooms. And I had so much come up for me that night at the beach. Mm, and Me too. You know, it's just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, we had a journey to the water that evening. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, I think what happened was we we intended to be recreational with it, but as the medicine kicked in, you and I are such healers and, and medicine people that we were like, oh, can't be recreational. <laughs> we have to go on our own journey and ceremony. Can't be. In, can't be in this circle space any longer. We need transition. <laughs> yeah. And we did. We went to the water and we had our own ceremony. Mm-hmm. And, and it was a full moon it, that night. It was great. That was like the... Eight- Some of my... Yeah. Some of my... Mo- Maybe that wasn't Valerie's birthday. I think that was a different event. But regardless, some of my most intense journeys have been around full moons. Mm. Um, but so, yes, just all to say that creating a healing space for yourself, in my opinion, is usually the best way to go in comparison to recreational use. But recreational use can be fun once in a while as well. Just comes with that disclaimer that like be ready for something to creep up on you. Exactly. It might happen. Exactly. And I want to add to that too, that um, doing the medicine intentionally in a ceremonial setting, something else that happens with the medicine is that your ego, your default mode network goes a little bit more offline and your higher consciousness comes more online. And so your body, it, it kind of lets those boundaries down because the ego is always in place trying to protect us, trying to protect us from new ideas, trying to protect us from getting eaten by a shark, getting hit by a car, by it's just, it's always trying to protect us. Don't spend the money because then you won't have money, right? And in that medicine space, the ego gets to relax a bit more, which makes it more receptive to those new ideas. So it's not just the neuroplasticity, really. It's it's that idea that our brain kind of calms down too. And so when we hear it, not only do we receive it and log it, more efficiently than we do without the medicine, but like we're open to it. Totally. So that brings me to the <laughs> the topic of integration. Mm. And what it what does integration mean to you? And why is integration such an important part of Let's go with psilocybin journeys. Integration is the important part of journeys. Um, Integration is the act of taking what you learned during the ceremony and figuring out how you're going to implement what you learned and discovered into your everyday life. And that's where the the real magic and the real change happens. You know, you can be shown like a a lot of people um, end up quitting cigarettes from smoking, end up quitting cigarettes from taking psilocybin. And what happens is, for instance, in that situation, it gets illuminated to them all of the ways in which they're treating their body like shit, all of the ways in which their body is begging to be healthier. And they immediately see the toxicity of the cigarettes and go, holy shit, I can't believe I've been putting that in my body. I need to stop. And so the integration from that specifically becomes no longer smoking cigarettes. Or are they so addicted that they need to phase out? But I actually can count quite a handful of people who have gone cold turkey after that. The integration is put healthier things in. And they even see improvements in their diet after that because they they begin to feel more in touch with healthier foods and how that makes them feel. Um you know, for me, another reflection is on the relationships and discovering that they were just simply lessons in the past. They didn't need to be this powerful story that controlled my everyday life. They didn't need to be thought about every single day. They didn't need to be wielded over me like a painful weapon. And so when I had those discoveries, the integration became identifying when I would think about those things. And how do I interject something else to no longer think about that, right? Because it's like the the loop that gets created in our head. So working, again, working with someone who can help with that integration process, who may have tools that they can teach you to implement things like breaking up the feedback loop inside of your head. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think like recently... 
recently, um, I had a big ketamine and cannabis journey as well and essentially got shown what would take your knowledge of constriction versus expansion and give you like a PhD on the topic was the the depth of understanding that I got to experience constriction, expansion, and then rooted, grounded expansion and what that does for the energy fields around. And so my integration with that has been consistently throughout the day identifying, okay, what state am I in? Am I in constriction? Am I in expansion? And if I'm in expansion, am I also grounded in that expansion? And so that becomes the application of the knowledge piece learned and then going through the everyday and beginning to make those changes so that when I catch myself in constriction, I go, "Uh uh-oh, I'm in constriction. Literally, life is harder right now because I, I am tense anywhere. So then letting go of the tension taking a deep breath. Often it's a regulation of the nervous system. So maybe it's a deep belly breath. And then allowing for the expansion and feeling, having a memory of what expansion feels like, tapping into that memory and feeling then that expansion around me and seeing how far I can push it. And then as I feel that expansion going, okay, but am I also grounded? If I check in with myself right now, I'm not completely grounded. So then dropping in, focusing on my root, focusing on my tailbone, maybe focusing on my feet or my connection points with the earth, and then feeling how that even changes my voice. And now when I'm in grounded expansion, it's a different sitting in the universe. So that's one example of a very detailed integration process for something that was learned in the medicine. Um, And oftentimes lessons can be much, much simpler than that. You know, they can be lessons of self-love or worthiness. Perhaps there was a mirror practice where um, I had a client last week. We did a lot of mirror, mirror work with, I am enough, I am worthy. And so as that becomes the new energy that's carried out of the ceremony, the integration is keeping that energy. What does it take to continue to feel enough every day? Is it taking 30 seconds in the mirror every morning and locking eyes with yourself and saying, hey, I am enough. I am worthy. I am a warrior. I am fucking epic. Or is it journaling those things and identifying the days when that energy isn't how you remember it from when you left ceremony. So integration is, is the key. It's definitely key because if, if you're not integrating and if you're not taking those things that you're learning and navigating how to apply them in your life, then you're really not taking away that the juicy knowledge and information that you're receiving and you can't not that you can't, but it becomes really hard to make change if you're not really focusing on integrating. Mm. And that's where having someone like yourself or having someone that is familiar with the medicine be able to really support you in transitioning out of that journey and into into your life and navigating how you want to apply those lessons into your life experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you for reflecting on on. The, the importance of that integration because we can sit here and talk about psychedelics all day every day but if if they're you know you're not taking that integration piece and moving forwards with it then where's where's the impact happening mm-hmm. right then you're not really looking within then you're continuing to look for a band-aid for that thing that lifts the mood that lifts the lifts it temporarily and instead when you doesn't get to the root exactly when you really look at yourself and you really implement the things that come up you can change what's going on for you so that that becomes your homeostasis absolutely so one thing i think that 
that is important to touch on here is harm reduction uh, when we're working with psychedelics. And are, I'm curious, like, are there any safety concerns to be mindful of when it comes to using psychedelics, uh, in particular psilocybin? And do you have any harm reduction techniques or recommendations for anyone thinking about stepping into the world of psychedelics? Yes. If you are on medications, you should definitely cross-reference a uh, list of medications with things that are compatible, not compatible with psilocybin, things like mood stabilizers, antidepressants often can have a counteraction with the medicine. So depending on your dosage, many many therapists are becoming adept now at, at having this conversation of what medicine is compatible with psilocybin, what's not. If not, there's a wonderful resource. His name is The Spirit Pharmacist. I highly recommend going to spiritpharmacist.com. Uh, he has countless resources and specializes as a pharmacologist, cross-referencing pharmacologist, pharmacist, uh, cross-referencing all of the pharmacology of the different prescriptions with the different medicines. So um, I, by all means, am not the end-all be-all expert on those and I continue to cross-reference myself, but things often like mood stabilizers as well as antidepressants um, would want to be discussed either tapering down or, um, yeah, discussing with your prescribing doctor if that's something that you can come off of in order to take the medicine. And so, yeah, being mindful of that to start. Um, also, some supplements can also be um, not not partners with the medicine. So MAOIs, uh, MAO inhibitors. So something going around, and especially the biohacking communities right now, is methylene blue. It's great for treating parasites. It's great for treating all sorts of things within the body, but it is going to significantly enhance the effects of the medicine. And <laughs> found that out by accident once. Methylene blue should have done my research beforehand. <laughs> um, so I'm very passionate about. I totally remember. <laughs> You're like Leah. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> my microdose like slammed me, and thank goodness I only took a microdose that day. Um, but so, yeah, so, you know, they're doing methylene drips at a lot of um, wellness clinics and things. So being very mindful, methylene blue, and how that may impact you. Um, other harm reduction techniques are, you know, really thinking about your mindset and your setting. Going into it, having clear intentions of what you want to work on, what you want to look at, being ready to go in there and to look at it. Um, if you're taking the medicine alone, you know, like you suggested earlier, let someone know, let someone know where you're going to be. Let them know that you'll check in with them when you're done. Um, being somewhere safe, somewhere that there is no foreseeable accident coming your way. There's no foreseeable security concerns. And sometimes that means it's not the woods. Sometimes that means mm -hmm. it's not out in nature, depending on the size of your dose. Um, you know, I love I love that people love to be in nature on these things, but I'm also happy to share with you that like in your home with candles lit, it's a, also a powerfully transformative experience. Somewhere where you can lock the doors and no one's coming in. You're not going to have to drive anywhere. You're not going to be subject to the weather. You're not going to be subject to a wild animal that may potentially find its way to you. Um, so th saying things to consider like that, your safety, are you going to be somewhere safe? Are you going to be somewhere where you will not be operating a car and paying attention to your mindset? Is it really something that you're able to handle in that moment and getting clear on it? Do you have any suggestions to add great. to that? No, I think you covered the majority of the, the, the big important ones. Um, and we we mentioned earlier that I think is also important to re re um, input here. You know, if you're doing psychedelics on your own or you're sitting with yourself, just letting someone know, mm -hmm. like having not not like a it's like a DD almost, right? Like the mm -hmm. um, like a designated person that knows that you're going deep into a journey especially if you're by yourself. Um, and so I always think that that's a, a good little safety 
safety tip to be mindful of, but I think that you covered the majority of of the the things there. Yeah. And if you're going to be taking the medicine for the first time by yourself, um, start small, build up. You never quite know how you're going to react, but the medicine does also affect people at different stages differently. For, for me totally. personally, I don't enjoy one gram. I feel uh, sensations and feelings that make me very uncomfortable at one gram. I am much more comfortable at five grams, which I don't recommend right off the bat. Um, so, so finding that dosage, do you want brighter colors? Do you want heart opening? That's probably just going to be a, a lower dose. Do you want the visuals? Do you want the clear messages? That may be two grams or more. So start small, build up. Totally. And I'll say too, I have gotten some very clear messages with smaller doses. Um, it's just a, it's a different kind of power in the message. Mm -hmm. Um, like the intensity is different, right? Like the, the more you take, but I've had some of my most powerful realizations on like 0.5 to one gram. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a matter of finding what you need for each circumstance, I think. Yep. And trusting the medicine isn't, is very intelligent. And she will often give you what you need. And I love to take a dose and trust that it is the right dose with the right message that I'm going to need at that moment. Mm, totally. We have a question from one of our listeners. Mm. And so one of our listeners here wants, is curious to know, if there are differences in the qualities of strain. Yes. Short answer, yes. Long answer, um, you know, just like we're seeing with marijuana and THC, there's this huge array of um, chemical compounds within the psilocybin. And so some strains are very um, very heavy in that, that chemical makeup. So there's a strain called penis envy, terrible name for a really brilliant strain, but it is one of the most intense strains that you can take. And so when you're dosing, knowing that you should actually dial that dosage down a little bit compared to other strains, um, and something like a, a golden teacher is, um, you know, you may take 3.5 grams and get beautiful visuals and, and heart opening. Whereas if you take 3.5 grams of penis envy, you may feel kind of like you get slammed by a gorilla while getting very different visuals. <laughs> and uh, when it comes to the, the actual mushroom itself, is there a difference between the stem and the cap? There is no difference between the stem and the cap. That is false, false news. <laughs> yes, I've I've heard a lot of people are like, oh, I only want the cap because the stem doesn't have as much psilocybin or psilocin particularly in it, and um, and that's just not the case. Correct. Yeah, there's um, new machines that are actually people can send their strains to to get chemical analysis, and so they've been actively disproving this myth, and it turns out stems and caps have the same amount of medicine in them. Good to know. Y'all, you guys heard it straight from Barrett. They have the same amount. You're going to have the same experience whether you take the stem or the cap. Yeah. Don't waste their, and those then, stems. There's a lot of them. Then don't waste the stems. <laughs> <laughs> and then one other question we have here is how does one learn to grow their own mushrooms? Ah, there's a lot of uh, places online that can walk you through that. Um, I know Double Blind has a great uh, online course on how to grow your own mushrooms. Um, it's a fairly easy process and one that can also is very easy to contaminate. Um, depending on what state you live in, here in California, we have an association called Decriminalize California, and they actually put on workshops, um, usually at least like once a month, all around the state about how to grow your own. So I highly recommend those, but it's a pretty, pretty simple process. There's like a bag that gets 
uh, disinfected and has substrate in it. And then you inoculate it with spores. So you inject spores into the bag. And um, I have clients who've been growing it in their closet, not humidity controlled, nothing and getting mushrooms. And then, you know, these um, other places that you look at where they've got the big bins and it's all humidity controlled and everything's taped and you're boiling everything. It's disinfecting and desanitizing everything like all the time. So it's all about really how, how deep you want to go with it. There's a great company called Shruly um, that has these, these cute containers that would go like on your, your kitchen countertop and they have grow lights in them. They sell substrates and they sell different substrates that you can grow any kind of mushrooms on. Um, so those look actually super cool. Like tending to get one of those grow some mushrooms. <laughs> cool. Thank you for the feedback. And question for me here, looking ahead, where do you hope to see psychedelics and particularly psilocybin uh, 20 years from now? And what is your personal mission in that vision? Gosh, uh, psilocybin's going to revolutionize the world. I see 20 years from now, all of the people who get to wake up because of it. I see a love revolution. And I'm not talking sexually. I'm talking about a self-love, unconditional revolution that begins to change how we interact with everything in the world around us, how we interact with each other, how do we interact with ourselves. And I don't know that, that everyone gets to be a part of that. There are certainly people who will refuse the medicine. But for those who take it, you never go backwards. You only go forwards. And I think once you've been exposed to that medicine, the transformational journey that we walk becomes one that we want to walk and one that we're continuously continuously excited to learn and evolve from. So 20 years from now, I cannot wait to see the amount of people who are love and light on this planet, the amount of people who are focused on being healers who are Self-healers, healers for their children, healers for their coworkers, healers for their friends, that it's not necessarily an occupation, but it's a frequency that we emit. And psilocybin is going to help get us there. And so my role in that is sharing the medicine, teaching people how to use the medicine safely, how to become their own healers, how to wake up. And in waking up, making better choices and being in control of their mind and creating their own future so that we can all get to this place together. I think it's a beautiful vision. Yeah. How cool would it be just to like be able to walk into any pharmacy and like grab like microdoses as like an over the counter like medicine? Like, well, yeah. So you say that and that's actually my, my grand plan for psychedelics. Personally, if I have anything to say with it, I think that we should have them as tools like we have in our medicine cabinet all the time and yeah. and to be able to trust ourselves enough to turn to the tool that we need that day. Maybe it's a, a little bit of ketamine that day. Maybe it's uh, a vitamin C because your immune system's feeling weak. Maybe it's a microdose, a psilocybin microdose. Maybe that particular day you actually need a, an ayahuasca ceremony. What do you need in that day? And having people know within themselves that same sort of knowing where you're like, oh, my body feels like shit. I need some magnesium. Perhaps my muscles aren't mm -hmm. recovering. Maybe I need some magnesium for my brain. Maybe I need some L-theanine to help me sleep. Like what are you – we have a, these giant supplement cabinets and yet most people don't seem to have psilocybin in there, don't seem to have CBD in there. And I think that's changing and that's wonderful. Mm, I agree so much. And I deeply resonate with you in that mission. I think that's why the, the universe brought us together is to just help empowering the people around us to be their own healers and to better be equipped 
to support themselves. Yes. Yes on yes. <laughs> so if someone's listened to this amazing conversation we've had today and they're curious about psychedelics, but they might be feeling a little bit afraid to try them, um, what would you say to that, that person? I would say certainly you're ready for the medicine when you're ready for the medicine, but also reflecting on is there a change that you wish was happening in your life that you are not seeing? And is there a pain that you are carrying? Is there some way that your life is being impacted? Are there others around you that are being impacted by whatever's going on for you in a negative way? And if so, then how long do you really want to wait before you start changing your circumstance, before you start changing your relationship to yourself so that you can change the relationship with everyone around you? Mm. How long? When is the time? And there's never a good time for a transformation. It's like, you want to try and schedule that? Like, good luck. We've got <laughs> kids in school, vacations planned, oh, end of the year, holidays, like, there's always a reason to say it's not a good time, which makes now the perfect time. I love it. I'm so on board. <laughs> and is is there anything that's like alive in you that you're feeling called to share in, in your final words with us here today? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. You don't know what you don't know. And if you haven't gone into the depths, you don't know what's there. And if you haven't sat in ceremony with someone who knows more than you, then you don't know what you don't know. And so I invite everyone to broaden their horizons. Even if you think you're a seasoned mushroom taker, you probably have something to learn by sitting with someone else someone else who's going to hold you, someone who's going to guide you that will show you the way to go even deeper than perhaps you thought possible. And if you're new mm. to it, even better. You don't know what you don't know. Amazing. Vera, thank you so much for sharing all of your amazing experiences and wisdom and knowledge with us today. And I encourage you, if you're listening, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Barrett, please go connect with her. And Barrett, where's the best place that someone can connect with you? I hang out on Instagram all the time. I'm at Barrett Perlman. And I'm also on Facebook, or you can reach out to me through my website, barrettperlman.com. Also got some free resources on there, like a microdosing workbook that has all of the information as well as a workbook to help you set your intentions and um, help you journal through the experience of intentionally using the medicine. So jump on there and grab that. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to shoot them over to me. I'm happy to share information about not only sitting with me in ceremony, but about the coaching that I offer alongside of that to really help you deepen your experience of self, to help you know your purpose and to help you walk through any transition that you're going through in life, whether that be a breakup, whether that be um, a new job or selling off an old company or perhaps retiring as an athlete, these sort of transitionary phases where you're feeling a little lost. I can help. Amazing. And I will be sure to put all of your information in the show notes so that you can easily find Barrett. Barrett, thank you so much for being here today. I love you so much. Thank you for being such an amazing human in my life and grateful that I had the opportunity to share all of you, all of you with all of my listeners. Hmm. Thank you so much, Leah. I really love being here with you and love supporting you on your podcast. And I deeply honor what you're sharing with the world and, and the healing voice that you have now transitioned into sharing. This journey has been incredible to witness of yours and I honor it and thank you. I love you so much. I love you too.
Thank you so much for tuning in with me today and for continuing to opt in to your inner work. If you found value in this conversation, please share it on social media or with someone you know that values both healing and growth. And I'd also like to invite you to join the Holistic Healing Tribe. This is my private community full of self-healers who are on a mission to optimize their physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Click the link in the show notes to join the tribe. And when you join, I'll send you my favorite things that have made the biggest impact on my health, my healing, and my growth. And finally, if you're anything like me and deeply care about seeing a more mindful approach to human evolution, please leave a review to help us reach more listeners and make a bigger impact on the world around you.